Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's workshop on accreditation. In the spirit of reconciliation, Practice Hub acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples today. Thank you so much for joining us for the first workshop in our Road to Excellence series. We've had an overwhelming response to this workshop, so clearly it's a topic of much interest and we have a great panel with us this afternoon who will be addressing some of the many questions which have come through during registration, which we thank you for. On our panel this afternoon, we have AgPEL's National Manager, Kim Angove. Kim is responsible for overseeing the day-to-day -day operations for the delivery of AgPEL accreditation. She has extensive experience and knowledge of accreditation and the RACGP standards, having been associated with AgPEL for more than 20 years. Her comprehensive industry experience has meant that she has influenced details contained within the RACGP standards to ensure that they are fit for purpose for practices throughout Australia. Joining Kim today, we have Carmel Brown, a seasoned practice manager and leading figure in practice management. Carmel actually undertook the first accreditation visit off a general practice in Australia. She is a fellow of the Australian Association of Practice Management and a former long-term committee member. Carmel's own practice has also recently successfully re-accredited. And last but not least, we have Anna Maria Gibb, the co-creator of My Practice Manual, now Practice Hub. Anna Maria has a background in practice management and qualifications in business and adult education. She is passionate about helping healthcare organizations run more efficiently and minimize risk using better business management systems and processes. I'll now hand you over to Anna Maria. Fantastic, thanks for Stephanie and thanks to everyone for joining us here this afternoon. So a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. Kim is going to be talking about keeping on top of those accreditation challenges. Carmel is going to give us her top tips on how to ace accreditation. We'll have a bit of a Q&A discussions. And then finally, at the end, I will do a bit of a demonstration of Practice Hub and how it can assist with your accreditation process as well. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Kim. Thanks so much, Anna-Marie. I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon, evening, wherever you are in Australia. And I think it's really special to be able to move to a virtual environment when being able to provide these education sessions. I know that some of you will be preparing dinner or still working within the offices or even at home. And so I'm glad that you're able to join us here today. So for my session here, I want to talk about the National General Practice Accreditation Scheme. Uh, you may be familiar or unfamiliar with, with the concept of the NGPA scheme. We'll talk about the RECGP standards for general practices and its structure. And most importantly, we'll go through the top five non-compliance areas. So for the National General Practice Accreditation Scheme, in 2017, the Department of Health authorised the administration of a general practice accreditation scheme framework, which is regulated by the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. So it provides a framework for general practices to be assessed against the RACGP standards and provides greater choice for practices when choosing an accrediting agency. It is endorsed by the Department of Health, the Commonwealth Department of Health, uh, and provides that governance framework so that there's a national coordination and an actual an approval process so that general practices are under the same framework. For the RACGP standards, for those that are unfamiliar with the RACGP standards, whether you're coming into general practice or practice management for the first time, or those seasoned practice managers or other support staff, the purpose of the RACGP standards, it shouldn't be seen as a burden. It should not be seen as red tape, and it certainly shouldn't be seen as a tick and flick process. The purpose is to protect patients from harm. And by doing so, you're improving the safety and quality in your general practice and you're providing the, the standards will provide you with a way of identifying and addressing any gaps. Uh, so a relative gap assessment, if you like, to strengthen your business so that you are there for the long haul for your patients. The structure of the standards has evolved over time. From the first to the fourth edition standards, it very much went into a section structure. However, with the evolution of the environment of healthcare, the RECGP did determine that the best approach would be to separate it into modules. You'll have a core a module, which is about your business, the structure of the business, the government, uh, the governance, as well as all of those things that really keep the business together. 
You've got the quality improvement module, which will relate to uh, things of how you can look at your practice and improve areas, whether it's clinical risk management, whether it's health record uh, maintenance. And then the third module is adaptable depending on the scope of service being accredited. So you'll all be familiar with the general practice module, which is specific to the scope of the service type of general practice. However, where we have a medical deputising service scope, where we have a after hour service scope or even a prison or a, a immigration detention centre, that third module is interchangeable and will come in and adapt the, the RACGP standards to the scope of service undergoing accreditation. So you may also be familiar with the announcement of the Medicare benefits schedule item number for HbA1c for point of care testing machines. And so the idea will be that those that are accredited against the RACGP standards fifth edition for, with the core module quality improvement and general practice module, the point of care testing standards will become what you'd like to call a fourth module for the standards. So the evolution of standards has also seen a change in focus. Previously, the RACGP standards were really focused on prescriptive nature and prescribing what it was that you had to do. And I feel as though this is probably what created the notion of burden, a notion of red tape. It's you're telling me what to do and I'm having to do it for a purpose. And it wasn't sustainable. And so the RACGP decided that they would take a step back in the development of the fifth edition standards and really focus on what are we trying to achieve here? And so previously, we'd focus on what was the process you needed to have. So the example we have on the screen in the fourth edition surrounding follow-up systems is the practice had to have a documented system to identify, follow-up and recall patients with clinical, clinically significant results. However, in the fifth edition, it's really refined to what is the goal that we're trying to achieve. And, as, and effectively, it's just that the practice recalls patients who have clinically significant results so however you choose to do that, it could be through a documented system. It could be through a virtual system. It's about a holistic approach. However, the fourth edition was really just prescribed to it being documented. And so the purpose of this is really to make sure it's sustainable over time and that you're maintaining the standards over time. There's always that notion that accreditation is just once every three years and there's a rush towards the end of the line to ensure that you're complying with what is necessary for the accreditation standards. However, by implementing processes that are suitable to your practice and just achieving that outcome, then perhaps that becomes more sustainable over time and it will just become part of everyday business. So what's important when preparing for the accreditation standards and how to determine what it is that is necessary to understand what is required and what it is that you might need to implement, it's really important to look at what the criterion is asking for and the explanatory notes. There are sections within each of the criterions. It's structured into what is the overarching purpose, and then we've got indicators as measure, but the explanatory notes outline why is this important? Why is it important from a safety and quality perspective to help re really understand why are we doing this? Not just a tick box approach, not just for accreditation, but what is it from the patient's perspective? What, it, what is it from the business perspective? There's also a section that breaks down each of the indicators, talking about uh, ways to demonstrate that the indicator is met. And so you might find what I suppose pseudo indicators within that where it talks about that you must or you should or you could have a documented system. And then right at the end of the standards, they have a list of examples of how a practice might choose to demonstrate compliance, which is entitled meeting each indicator. Now, what's important is the points under each of them meeting each indicator is not an exhaustive list. However, it does highlight the non-negotiables, what you must do to meet the requirements. And so as the example here in the, the criterion, probably the only criterion of standards that fits on one page, you've got what is the criterion looking for in call module 1.1. It's essentially information about your practice. The indicator breakdown is what is it that we're trying to achieve in an outcome focused way? Why is this important? Has its heading sectioned out as is meeting this criterion? And included in that are important aspects. So when you're advertising certain things in your practice information sheet or on the website, 
what is it that you must do when considering advertisements keeping in line with the MBA code of conduct? And then you'll see at the bottom of the screen, meeting each indicator outlines you must. So the non-negotiable is that in meeting this particular indicator is that you must make practice information available to patients and you must update it if there are any changes. However, how you do that is up to you. It could be a practice information sheet. It could be a variation of an information sheet, brochures, posters, as well as websites and Facebook pages. So what's most important is you look at your own practice. You look at how it is that you're going to reach the demographic. If you're in a, in a high population of low socioeconomic uh, people who may not have ready access to internet or elderly patients who may not be as uh, tech savvy, then perhaps a website is not relevant for you and it would be a practice information sheet that you would choose. But however you do it, all you need to do is make it available to the patients and update it if there are any changes. So when we're looking for the application of evidence, as mentioned, for most indicators, you can choose how you meet the intent of the indicator. And so this provides you with the increased flexibility to make sure that your systems and processes that you implement reflect your preferred way of working now and into the future. And so, as mentioned before, it's always that concept that accreditation is once every three years and it's a mad rush at the end. And perhaps by choosing ways that will meet your needs and your preferred way of working, that approach will make it easier for you to maintain uh, thereafter. So moving to the top non-compliances. The data that we collate over time, so we collect data with all of the practices undergoing accreditation against the fifth edition standards, what are their compliance ratings to each individual indicator, criterion and standard. And so the data extracted for the purposes of this presentation hasn't changed much between now and two years ago when the fifth edition started. It seems to be really quite consistent as to what are our top non-compliance areas. And so over 3,000 practices have been assessed against the fifth edition standards. And so this data is based on the collection of that. So at number five, we have criterion QI 2.2E. Our clinical team ensures that medicines, samples, and medical consumables are acquired, stored, administered, supplied, and disposed of in accordance with manufacturer's directions and relevant laws. So 11.78% of practices have had non-compliance rating against this particular indicator. Some of the common reasons, they and they are common reasons and things to, to keep an eye out for when you're preparing for your accreditation and implementing your procedures ongoingly, is expired medical consumables. It's about making sure that your stock rotation arrangements or your stock checking arrangements are methodical. I know that a lot of practices use a little colored dot system that you put the month or year or different colors for different years or different months on your medical consumables, on your medicines. But having expired medical consumables is an increased risk to patient harm. And so it's really important that you do have a solid stock rotation and consumable review processes. So the uh, Schedule 4 and or Schedule 8 storage arrangement. So what's most important is that this is one of the few indicators where it's directly relating to jurisdictional requirements, so legislation, and it's really important for practices to be making sure that they're meeting their regulations. And so when it comes to S8 storage arrangements, we could come across practices where the Schedule 8 medicines are not stored securely. I know that in Queensland, there's really quite strict specifications as to the type of material used for safes and where it's bolted in the floor and things like that. And so it's also about the accessibility that you don't have a practice manager in a state where it is considered unauthorised access, where only a GP is allowed to have access to S8 storage. S4s, similarly, there are some states require the Schedule 4 medication to be locked others just require it to be inaccessible. So what's important here is that you look at the jurisdictional requirements in your state and you follow the storage arrangements accordingly. The most common non-compliance that we do see in relation to this is when practices have samples that they provide to patients and those samples are not being labelled according to legislation. It could be that the keep out of reach of children is not printed in red 
it could be that the practice's name or address is not included on the label or the patient's name or the dosage instructions, or it could just be that they're not labelled at all. So again, what's important is that you reference your legislation, the regulations for the Poisons Acts within your state or territory to make sure that if you are holding sample medications that you are supplying those to patients appropriately labelled. And uh, what's probably less common nowadays, but still does pop up from time to time, is SA records, missing key details, whether the supplier name and address or patient name and address is not included uh, within the SA record. Historically, we used to have issues with the type of record book that practices were keeping, that they were just loose leaf pages that you could easily rip out a page and, and there'd be no evidence of a page ever existing. Uh, that's less common these days, but it's still a common non-compliance in terms of medicine management. So at number four, we have business risk management. So uh, criterion C, 3.1 indicator C, our practice has a business risk management system that identifies, monitors and mitigates risk in practice. So 13.52% of practices have achieved a not met rating at the initial on-site assessment. And I can understand why. It is a new concept within the RACGP standards and it is not just about clinical risk. I think that's probably what the most common misconception is is associating just risk and assuming that it is clinical risk. Of course, we've got a clinical risk management system. We document adverse events and, and near misses. However, this is not just about clinical risk. It's about your business because what's important is it you have these appropriate business risk management systems in place to mitigate whatever the worst case scenario might be. And it's really important when considering the risk within your practice to use a risk matrix now, the example I have on my screen here is just one of a multitude of ways that you could actually set out your risk management matrix. You could name, number it, you could reference it to be low, medium, high risk. But essentially what you're doing is you're trying to mitigate the risks of those that are in red. And so the things to consider, you could Google all day and you could find variations of business risk management systems. But I think as a good start, what you could be looking at when considering how to mitigate your risk. You could look at compliance risk, security risk, financial risk, reputational risk, and operational risk. So when considering each of those compliance risk, what is the risk to your business if you were to not achieve accreditation? What is the risk to your business if you were to not comply with your legislations, whether it's Schedule 8 records, whether it is ATO compliance, it, whether it's compliance even with your local laws? So when you break down what is it that you're actually expected to be doing as part of your business operations, and when you break that down, what is the, the likelihood and the consequence? So when it comes to practices that live and breathe, quality improvement, live and breathe accreditation, the chances of not maintaining your accreditation could be considered rare, but the consequence might only be moderate because you know how to, or even negligible. If you think about if you didn't have accreditation, would you still maintain some level of, of compliance? You might have resources that you refer to. You might not just not be formally accredited. It could be negligible. However, there could be certain aspects of your business that really makes it quite extreme. So if you are a registrar teaching practice, if you are accessing PIP, which majority of practices are, is that an extreme consequence to you if you don't maintain compliance to the standards and therefore don't maintain your accreditation? And you could associate that with financial risk also. What are the financial impacts if a business was to be opening up down the road, if you were to have some sort of a competitor come in? Uh, what are the mitigation strategies that they, then you need to actually reduce that risk? Security risk could be even fraud within your practice as well as access. So you access physically or virtually, but then you often hear in the media about fraudulent activity within practices. Reputational risk is one of those ones where you think, okay, well, what's the likelihood of a client, of a customer complaint or a patient complaint? And how do you then manage those risks accordingly? Operational risk, we're experiencing it right now with COVID. In maintaining the external environmental factors, how is it that 
you are able to actually manage your environment and move to a remote um, setting. So it's really important to really consider all of those different factors and then adapt accordingly. So three on the list is CPR training with 19.07% have not met. And this is really quite a simple one. To me, it's really about documentary evidence. It's about not maintaining your documents and having those readily available. So for CPR training, it's really important that all non-clinical team members complete the CPR training and it must be completed within the last three years. And it must be conducted by an accredited training organisation or can be conducted by a clinical team member that has a current instructor certificate. And of course, it must include a physical demonstration. A course solely online does not meet this indicator requirement. Similarly, for what is our second top non-compliance, qualifications and education and training for the clinical staff. So this is really focused on the ARPA registration, CPD documents and training in CPR. And again, it's really about record keeping. So 28.63% of practices have a not met rating against this particular indicator. So one of the musts of this in the meeting each indicator is you must keep records. And so it might not necessarily be that your GPs or your clinical staff aren't registered. It might not be because they're not actively participating in CPD. It's just those records are not available to demonstrate on the day. And for our top non-compliance, we have 31.62% of practices having not achieved compliance to this indicator is practice team immunizations. So what's important in terms of meeting this particular indicator, I know that it's something that has actually come up quite frequently is if COVID is going to be included in this. But currently the standards are asking that we refer to the Australian Immunisation Handbook. So the Australian Immunisation Handbook identifies that influenza, hepatitis Bs, B, measles, mump, rubella, whooping cough and chickenpox are the immunisations relevant to healthcare workers. And so what's important is that evidence is required for all practice team members, including allied health specialists, uh, we're determined to be part of the practice team as to whether or not they there is a signed refu refusal form or whether or not they have actually received those relevant vaccinations. And so when considering what vaccinations to give to the relevant team members, it's really about looking at their roles and the risks inherent with their roles. And so influenza is highly transmissible and so therefore all team members should have an annual influenza vaccination. But when you're looking at uh, hepatitis B, really only those tasks that involve the possibility of exposure to blood or body substances, whether that's direct patient contact or indirect patient contact, would be ideal. So you might not necessarily have reception staff that would be necessary to have hepatitis B. However, if they are handling soil or contaminated linen, if they are removing bins or anything like that, then that's one of those vaccinations that would be really important. And I think we've come to the end of that. Kim, thank you. That was so informative. Would you mind if we ran a question by you that's just come in? And it's one around CPR. It says it's quite confusing because the certificates say each 12 months and accreditation says every three years. So which is correct? So for accreditation purposes, it's once every three years. So for the Australian Resuscitation Council guidelines, their recommendation is a refresher occurs every 12 months. And that's why the certificates are dated 12 months, because it's a part of the ARC guidelines external to accreditation. But for accreditation purposes, it's in the last three years at your accreditation assessment. So once every three years. Fantastic. Thank you very much. All right, uh, so please keep your questions coming in. But what we'll do is circle back to those. So, Carl, sure, sure. we will move along to your thoughts. So away you go. Thanks, Anna Maria. And thanks, Avant, for the opportunity to be involved in the webinar. I've done a lot of accreditation cycles. I've just finished the fifth edition standards and we've just got through. Everyone who does this, if you've never done one, you've got to realise that the accreditation bodies are there to support you and guide you through it. And also the surveyors who we have every time have been really there to help us through the day. Kim covered a lot of the areas of non-compliance, but I thought I'd just give you a bit of a few tips from a practice perspective. They've talked about 
what's required, you know, the hep B, the flu, the influenza. I personally would like all my staff, of course, to be vaccinated. And I must say they all have been for COVID. A little tip, when people start with you, I think you should give them the expectation of what's required. In case you have someone who doesn't believe in vaccination by any chance, really, do you want to have someone, because we have to provide a safe, a safe environment for both our staff and for our patients. So that's just a little tip. I always ask them, you know, what they've been vaccinated for and, you know, with they, and tell them what we require in the practice. They talk about qualifications and the education. So make sure you get all your doctor's CPD points. I've asked each one of them to print out in the current trimester, which is 2020 to 2022, so that, you know, to see how far along they are. I check the nurse's registration because they have to be, they have to do CPR every year as part of their registration, even though accreditation only requires it every three years. So they are all very aware of this and make sure that to get their registration done, that they do CPR as well. Now, I, I store all of this. I actually use the practice hub and I store all this information on the hub and also the reminder so that it keeps popping up to me when they're due again to have CPR training done or to make sure they're registered on all this sort of thing. So the GPs, by the way, only need theoretically to do CPR every three years as your non-clinical staff have to. Again, that's always up to your doctors, but they must have done some CPR in the three years. The business risk management, I must say, Kim, that took us a little bit of time to sort out. I looked at what's required. So things like the reputational risk, I think, you know, all our staff are on Facebook. You know, we had to discuss with them that we don't want the practice to be discussed. Any issues that they think is happening in the staff, we don't want it on Facebook because that's an open medium. And um, this is really important, you know, to protect the reputation of the practice. That this isn't just allowed, you know, open slather. The financial risk where well, we struggle because we're a private billing practice and telehealth, especially last year when we were forced to not bill everyone, and, and our move, that's been a big financial risk to us um, and it's taken all this year to sort of slowly get sorted out. But again, that was a part of the business management, so we're able to see that as a risk and how we dealt with it. Even simple stuff, all your, all your equipment in the treatment room needs to be tagged and tested. It needs to be validated for your sterilisation, all these things. And the, the trick with the big practice especially is to keep an eye on it. And the way I do, of course, is through the hub because it puts my reminders in. I put the certificates in, it's all there each time. Virus protection is very important. You've got to make sure that whoever's looking after that part of your practice really make sure it's very tight but because you know even one of our doctors went on google to look at something for a patient and next thing there seemed to be a an issue with the virus and immediately our security was onto it but i just think be very make sure that that's all in place because that's really a big risk to practices kim uh, mentioned talked about the medicines management my little tip to you all is make sure your GPs don't squirrel away medication because ours love doing that. The rep will give them something they think they might use and suddenly it's out of date and it's sitting in the bottom of their drawer. So that's the sort of issues that I saw with the risk management. Very simple stuff, you know, risk management assessment. But they were, the surveyor was also really helpful. We had quite a little talk about how, you know, what we did with it and how we dealt with it. What do we do with our practice team? So it's a big job. Um, it's always daunting. Um, it's always daunting. You should start early. Um, you should share it as much as you can. So I, I've got a sort of a senior nurse who oversaw it with the treatment room nurses, um, all that, that make sure everything was right there. She went through every doctor's room. We made sure everything was assessed within the year. We gave the nurse to also to get to check on all these vaccinations that are required to make sure that if anything was, you know, a bit outstanding and would the staff like to be re-immunised for just say hep B or uh, any of the other immunisations that are offered. Everyone had to have a flu shot. There was no ifs and buts about that. We also had the GPs involved, so the, especially the main GP, who, because he was a bit daunted by it all and he was, you know, so we talked to him and relaxed him about what was required and, and he was fine on the day. With using the practice hub, I actually gave our surveyor access before she even came so that she was able to sort of jump on board, go through it, see how we were meeting the standards against the pre-assessment. So, and that, I think, made a big difference to the day in terms of getting through it faster for us. 
um, she was fine, you had a long interview with us, but she was able, she had looked at a lot of the stuff before she came. So lastly, my top tips, start early, use all your staff, communicate with the accreditation bodies. You know, they, they always ask if they can help. Relax on the day because it's daunting, but it, choose who you're going to, who's going to do the interview. So now it's, you're not springing it on anybody. I actually spoke with the surveyor and I wanted to get her to run through how she wanted, or that they wanted the day to run. We offered them tea and coffee when they started they were, and halfway through because it's actually quite a long afternoon or morning. Remember, your surveyors are here to help. If they find there's something missing and we can actually locate it, and maybe pull it down off the net, she was really happy for that to happen and to be shown to her so that they're actually there really to get you going. So, And just be relaxed with them because they're there to work with you on this. So... The practice hub used constantly, of course, through it. Everything in, that I do at our practice runs through the hub. So every um, every interview, every meeting, everything is, is compiled in there and linked back to the accreditation standards. So that's about my follow through today. That's Thank you, Anna Maria. Fantastic, Carmel. Thank you. Some great tips there. I think probably, Kim, you'd agree it's about surveyors are there to help. And, you know, I think that's that's the thing. They've got a wealth of experience themselves and to be able to relax and be prepared and then you can relax. Absolutely. All right. So next on our program for this afternoon is for us to do a bit of a discussion and answer your questions. So quite a few have come in. Let's work through those. So ladies, if you wouldn't mind standing by. We had a question, any advice for new practice owners to make the process easy? Look, I think, Carmel, your tips have really been helpful in that regard. And Kim, I think those top five areas of low non-compliance, combining those items is probably a really good way of thinking of the first timers. Kim, could you address a question regarding cover for out of hours when your normal working hours don't include Saturday morning? Absolutely. And it is actually strangely something that we're finding more and more at the moment. And I'm glad that this is actually a question that has come up. So What's important in terms of meeting the RACGP standards and particularly or uh, specifically in relation to after hours arrangements is it's about what is your after hours care. So you need to have suitable arrangements for when your practice is closed. So you could close on a Tuesday morning or a Tuesday afternoon or routinely on a Friday afternoon, but you need to make sure that you've got suitable arrangements in place so that your patients can still access care when your practice is closed. And so what is challenging about those that use a medical deputising service as their after hours provider, it's important to identify and be aware that medical deputising services are not allowed to be operating between the hours of 8am and 12pm on Saturdays, because it's not defined as the Commonwealth's after hours, or it's not as part of the, the Commonwealth defined after hours period. And so if you're usually using a medical deputising service, you don't have to open on a Saturday morning. As mentioned, it's, it will then become part of your after hours care arrangements, but you do need to have arrangements in place to allow patients to access care and for you to be able to receive a communication on a timely manner from those that you have those arrangements with. So if you use another provider, that provider and yourself, your practice needs to have a documented agreement in accordance with the standards. You could have GPs on call, and triaging the patients to determine is this actually a consultation that needs to take place now? Should they be directed to a hospital or an ambulance? Or can they uh, perhaps wait until the deputising service does start operating? However, your practice still needs to be in a position to see that patient if it's determined that it cannot wait. And so whether or not that's at a home visit consultation or uh, you go and decide to meet the patient at your clinic and just don't open, but see the, the patient there, meet the patient there. You do need to have those arrangements. Excellent. Okay, lovely. Thank you for that. There's a number of questions. Obviously, a hot topic is the immunisation area. So let's have a look at some of these questions. So we have an instance, a question around a GP stated that they had had hep B, but the surveyor asked to cite the serology. And I'm guessing maybe couldn't or wasn't provided. So where would they stand with that? And that leads to another question about what is the best way to prove that immunisations have been completed? Documentation. So 
verbal confirmation of immunizations is not satisfactory for the purposes of the standards. And if you link it back to the RACGP's infection control standards, it's really important as a business owner or as an employer or as somebody who has contractors coming into your premises, that it's important you meet your workplace obligations to ensure a safe environment for uh, the people that work there as well as the patients coming in. And so documentation really allows you to make suitable arrangements should any of your GPs, staff, allied health are not suitably immunised during an outbreak so that you can redeploy them to other areas. We know currently with the COVID and the working from home, we've got those that, that aren't vaccinated just yet with COVID. And so the most appropriate method for them for the safety of themselves as well as the patients is they're moving into a, a working from home environment. And so it, without knowing the specifics of this particular incident where there was a non-compliance, it sounds like it could have just been a verbal, yes, I've had it. The specific comment about the surveyor being asked to cite serology, what's important is that you don't have to have had serology tests. If you're documenting the immunizations in a checklist, if you are signing to declare that so you've got a clinician who is explaining the risks inherent with a staff member's role. You're advising them of their best immunizations that are suitable to them. And then if you even just have a, a checkbox, it could be an Excel spreadsheet. It could be a Word document with columns. AgPal has a template that is available in its resources where you just check to say, yes, this is an immunization that has been received and the date that has been received. So... We know that serology testing is beneficial because you know then what the immunity levels are, whether or not there's natural immunity or if the vaccination has provided the adequate immunity. However, serology testing can also, also be beneficial to those that don't know their vaccination status, that they don't know when the last time they had a hepatitis B vaccination. And therefore, rather than having it again, that perhaps they'll go and get a serology test to just check to see if they do need it. So serology can be a form of evidence. However, essentially declaring that you've got, you've had that, the relevant immunizations or even refusal. You don't have to have had any of these vaccinations. However, the practice does need to consider what at risk there is. If you don't know the, the immunization status or vaccination history, where you're providing care face-to-face -face with patients where there is an outbreak. So there could be a risk to the patients if you don't know your staff's vaccination status and vice versa, there could be a risk to your staff. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Kim. Kim, I notice there's a number of questions coming in, and I think partly because on the slide that you had, it had the influenza and then the other two yep. in there. Yep. It, it, uh, can you just clarify, because there's a couple of questions around, are they... Are they um... Yeah, so what is here is what is it relevant to the, the immunisation handbook, so the recommended vaccinations for healthcare workers. And so this is what you should actually do in considering what is actually the best or the most appropriate vaccinations relevant to each of those staff members' roles. And so because we know that the highly transmissible nature of influenza and we do have an annual vaccine because of um, how it evolves over time it is recommended so all team members it is recommended to have uh, annual influenza you don't have to have any of these vaccinations it is not mandatory for anyone to have any vaccinations however as a business you need to consider what risk is there if they don't and so I do understand that there are some work environments that will just not allow you to work there at all. So you cannot be an employee in certain industries, in certain settings, in certain government, if you haven't had certain vaccinations. But for general practice, these are recommended vaccinations. And it's about, is this relevant for that person in that role? And so when you look at the individual tasks, then you consider what is the risk here to that staff member and should they then have that vaccination and Carmel I'm sure this is probably something a conversation you have with your team isn't it it's not about helping them to understand why certain vaccinations are recommended yes most of the staff we have Anna Maria really understand the need for vaccination I mean we don't really have any issue with this I'm just reading more about whether the COVID vaccine will also be added because that's also highly contagious so 
yes, I, I don't have any, I've never had a staff member who's refused, let's go that way. And I think working with GPs and discussing it at lunchtime and things, they also very much understand the risks. I am also very upfront with people about it before I employ them, what they require. Excellent, thank you. There's a question on here about do new staff members need to provide a history of their CPD? So when you're looking at clinicians, so GPs or clinical staff members, it will be important that a history of their CPD is gathered upon commencement because it's really important as part of their ongoing obligations, whether or not they're part of ARPA registration or their own professional organisation registration, they will have to be assigned tasks and work within scope of their duties. And therefore, having the relevant CPD evidence as an ongoing basis of evidence is important. However, new administrative staff, not necessarily. So when you're looking at the requirements of the standards, for non-clinical staff, it's about them having received training relevant to their role. So what could actually be relevant in their past could be relevant in your practice and therefore you would want to seek evidence of it. So CPR is a good example, knowing that CPR training for accreditation purposes is three years. Mm-hmm. So if they've done CPR training in a previous practice or previous work environment, then it would be important that they provide that information to you because it's important for you to keep on record for the purposes of accreditation. However, for administrative staff, it's really it's about the tasks that they're involved in with your practice. So induction documents, it's about what other on-the-job training that they undertake that is relevant to their role at your practice. But certainly when we're looking at GPs and other clinical staff, it would be relevant to gather that information. Uh, What would be challenging, I understand, is for those staff members that do start that are of a clinical nature just before the accreditation assessment. Unfortunately, you will need to have evidence of CPD and all of the other requirements that are HR related for those personnel on the day of the assessment, because that's the point in time that you're undergoing accreditation. Excellent. Lovely. Thank you, Kim. We had a question about, do you need to provide access? If you're a practice hub user, do you need to provide access if you've uploaded the documents to the AgPal hub? No, you don't. That's really at your discretion. And Carmel, I know you mentioned your surveyor sort of had a logged into your practice hub site beforehand. That's very much at the discretion of the surveyors, isn't it, Kim? So very much around some do, some don't, but it's whatever their preference is, but it's really up to them at their discretion. I think what's also important to highlight here, Anna Maria, is that what you might be uploading into the AgPals accreditation hub is not everything that you would be requiring to evidence on the day of accreditation. So there would be a lot of evidence that you would have in practice hub that would be important for the surveyors to cite on the day. And so therefore, it would be necessary to provide them with access. However, the access would be on the day um, of the accreditation assessment. Yeah. And I think too, on the day, it gives them a chance to get that kind of whole of practice view of of everything as well. Sort of has a bit of contact. Carmel, there's a question about, did you get any feedback from the surveyor regarding your practice hub site? They were really happy to have, it, have done all this before they got there so that, you know, the process at the practice would be quite seamless. There was nothing that they were missing. They seemed to understand how it worked. Yeah, so they just said everything was fine from that point of view and therefore we could get on with things like interviews, treatment room stuff, interviews with the doctors. So, uh, yeah, there was, there was nothing to say from, from our surveyor. I'm just thinking about this to say that there was any problem with it. She understood how it worked and it worked seamlessly with the accreditation. Perfect. And there's a question around who decides which of the clinical team or which GP is going to be interviewed by the surveyor. Do you determine that? Did you determine that beforehand? Yes, yeah, definitely. They don't, they're, they've never, they've always come in and asked, well, who's going to do the GP survey? Who's going to do it? I've never had any issues from that point of view. A few of the GPs were a bit um, concerned about having to do it. So um, I got the fellow who's done it a few times for me before. The nurses, we you know, nominated the nurse who'd been the longest, the usual things you do with them, with the, the, the visit. Um, and the only issue is, and a lot of the surveyors go along with just a random front desk staff to ask a few questions. So they're all a bit anxious on the day, but they're all fine. It, it really goes quite seamlessly. Kim, did you want to add anything to Carmel's comments about the who gets chosen or how that Yeah, it's, it's really up to the practice. There might be occasions where the surveyors are walking around and they might want to ask a, an ad hoc question to a receptionist that wasn't a primary interviewee. 
uh, just to verify something, but certainly all the preparation beforehand will ensure that all your staff are well, well aware of, of what questions might be posed to them. And, and so they should see it as a frightening experience. Yeah. Very good. There's a question here about, I think it's an adverse react. Is an adverse reaction compulsory when the clinician records the allergy status? Yeah, so it is. Uh, it forms part of the health summary requirement that the adverse drug reactions are to be recorded as part of the patient health record. So that's um, QI21B is the indicator requirement there. And so What's important here to identify is that the aspiration being that each of the patient health records contains a complete and up-to-date health summary. However, for accreditation purposes, what we'd be looking for is that at least 75% of active patient health records have met that particular requirement. But yes, it is part of the list there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does the surveyor need to cite their medical indemnity certificates as well as their RECGP CPD statement and their ARPA registration? No, not for accreditation purposes, not medical indemnity. Okay. If you are participating in research, the indemnity associated with that research is relevant to retain on file. However, for the criterion that was part of the top non-compliance, it's about the ARPA registration, it's about CPD and it's about CPR and their vocational recognition, which, or that they're part of a training organisation, which you could get most of that information off the ARPA registration. Okay. Last couple of questions. So somebody has asked, where do you get a GP position description? I'll answer from the Practice Hub perspective, which is we have templates for position descriptions. But I know it's one of those things that a lot of practices go, oh, I need a position description for a GP. They've got one for everyone else in the practice. So where do they find that? I guess for some of them, that just doesn't come top of mind to have a PD for, for the GP. Yeah, well, I mean, it is something that we have a template available, but I mean, I suppose it's really, it's important to, you've got, you've got the shell, you've got something to work off and you just adapt it. So you actually might even need to find a various sources to be able to pull it together because you've got some that will act, be acting as a medical director. You've got others that might not necessarily um, have certain clinical roles. They might have other clinical roles and governance roles. But certainly uh, we've tried to include all of what we think could be part of the general practitioner position description. And we certainly have one of those available as a template on our website uh, for those that are ACFA clients also. Yeah. So I think there's a few out there and someone in the group has very kindly posted that the PHNs um, have some good online resources as well. So which could possibly include that. I've just been circling back, Carmel, to the question about the feedback from the surveyor. It was more about after they logged in before the visit, did they give you any feedback or was it kind of when they came on the day you knew they'd been in? When they came on the day. So I, told, I gave them access. They had to look at it. I could see that they were looking at it. They then came on the day. They were happy that they'd done it. There was no concerns with it. It was quite seamless. It's quite easy to negotiate around. They didn't really have any suggestions, Brett, so they were fine. Excellent. Now, somebody has mentioned that around incident reports and near misses, sometimes they're not top of mind to record these things, especially if they seem minor. So what's the, maybe from both of you, a hot tip on how to remember to record these things? Do you have a process? Carmel, do you have a process? Well, in actual fact, you know, we've actually, over three years, we actually have a lot of report incidents, you know, little things that have gone on. The trick is to log them because you will never remember them on, as it comes close up and you know I actually had to go because we're, I've been so busy with COVID I had to go around and say to the staff what's been going on can you and they would say yes but do you remember this happened or you know we had to do this near you know there was no near misses particularly but you know incidents where one of the nurses actually had a needle stick and yes so we start to log all this down because you actually do have things it's just you forget if you wait till the end so the important thing is the moment anything happens go straight in and log it that's my, my only tip to do it because you won't remember. Excellent. Somebody has asked about the risk management. Does it have to be written down in Excel or Word document those with, the, with the risk table and the coloured boxes all for review? Can you maybe just give us some examples of the types of ways people record risk? Is yeah, and I think if we draw back to what is the purpose and the structure of the standards and what are we trying to achieve here is that practices really should be adopting ways that works well for them. So if a Word document works well for you with tables, 
uh, or if you're a whiz with Excel, then those might be your go-to. You might have bespoke software where you can record all of the information, but really what we'd be looking at is that you've identified the nature of the risk. What is it specifically? So you wouldn't overarchingly say operational risk and then that's all your consideration. It's it's drill it down. And there are some examples in the standards, you know, talking about the risk of um, not having adequate clinical records or unexpected absence of staff. And so it's really about identifying what is the risk and what are your existing mitigation strategies. And so if you've got a solid foundation for policies and procedures and documents and checklists that you follow, then you know that you're pretty well sorted with your existing mitigation strategies. And so that's how you then form your risk rating based on how you've been able to mitigate that. So do you have annual training for clinical staff in stock rotation? You follow up with the checklist that they're following to make sure that there's no expired dates, that you do a, a stock check on a regular basis and you're not identifying things. And so it's about what are you commonly seeing and what it is that you're doing to mitigate those risks. And then uh, think about what additional strategies you'd like to implement as part of that. What have you identified that maybe you could be doing better or should be doing better? And this is where it's really important to get a whole of team approach because more minds, you know, create, invoke thought between others and, and you can come up with some grand ideas from, from others as to how to mitigate a lot of the risks. And then you can do a reflection on your risk rating there as you've, adi- you've added additional uh, mitigations and therefore uh, you might have decreased the risk in your practice. So however you want to consider and record it is entirely up to you. But what's important is that you do have that as a documented approach because you may need to revisit it and you may then can use that as part of your quality improvement opportunities as well. Kim, I think this one's for you. Have the standards changed in the past three years since the fifth edition was released and what were those changes? So no, there's been no changes. They've, I suppose there's been a couple of grammatical updates that they've made over time, but nothing to write home about. However, it is timely that this question is brought up because the RECGP are working on some changes currently and will be due to release those hopefully towards the end of the year, if not next year. And I think it's really about adopting what current environment everybody's working in and and really bringing into considerations of what to do when it comes to telehealth. So it's incorporating telehealth into parts of the requirements of the explanatory notes. It's about incorporating in the infection control standards what considerations, potentially additional of what COVID has actually brought out in the healthcare environment. So watch this space. There will be changes upcoming and they will be highly communicated. We're not going to see anything that's going to include any substantial changes to any mandatory indicators. I know that there was some articles floating around through the media recently about defibrillators becoming mandatory. Things like that are not on the cards at the moment. So they wouldn't implement changes that would increase the scope of a mandatory requirement. So that for now will still be a discretionary indicator. However, it's just more about evolving the standards to the current environment and helping to to have that platform of a framework for practices. Excellent. A question about the AGPAL portal there. If you've already done the fifth edition accreditation and due for re-accreditation, will your previous information still be there? Yes, it should still be there if you haven't archived it. And just one back to, again, as I say, obviously the immunisation is a really hot topic. (laughs) If a non-clinical staff member is refusing, what is the process the practice needs to follow for the purposes of accreditation, I guess? I think that's where you probably need to get medico-legal advice in terms of what risk to the business and to the patients that you have, because it might actually be something where They can't perform that specific duty and therefore you need to redefine their role if it's a significant part of their role. But certainly if you're open to redefining the scope of their duties based on not knowing that level of immunisation, then that is certainly something to consider. But if you're looking more at the risk of a patient as opposed to the staff member, you're pretty much mitigating the risk if they're refusing themselves. You must get them to document that refusal. So then the onus is back on them from a a WHS perspective. However, if that immunisation is something that puts the public at risk and your patients at risk, and then that's where you actually need to consider 
what is the best approach for your business to mitigate that business risk. Excellent. Thank you. And just a query around telehealth. Is telehealth kind of the all-encompassing for phone and online consults? Absolutely. And I suppose I probably shouldn't have used telehealth because that's what they're not doing in in the standards. It's the, the electronic form of communication or the alternative. So it will be video, it will be FaceTime or other methods, and it will definitely be telephone consultations, recognising that there's various methods, so it won't just be confined to the video. We had a question earlier, and I have deliberately left this to the end because I thought it was a nice way to wrap up. We have somebody who's very new to a new practice and first time around with accreditation. Just some words of encouragement, maybe from both of you. Carmel, would you like to maybe think back to your first time doing accreditation? <laughs> what were, Thinking about that, what words of encouragement would you share with our new, new practice manager or our practice manager in the new practice doing this for the first? time i would say to them that work slowly through it don't they're at the accreditation people are actually on your side they're happy to help don't get to yourself in a knot about it because you get there's help coming from everywhere to do it properly accreditation's made a huge difference over the years to general practice so just relax get it done ask other people i'm always happy to help if anyone wants anything ag is happy to help as well so that's my advice to you Don't be too concerned. Just get it through, get through it. Yeah. And my advice would be don't do it alone. This is really much a whole of practice thing. And there's a lot of networks out there of practice managers that are absolutely willing to support one another because they do appreciate how overwhelming it is. AgPal appreciates how overwhelming it is. We just recently underwent our own accreditation assessment and that's a week long of an assessment. So five days, full days of assessment activity, and it is exhausting. And it's just one of those senses of achievement at the end of the day, though, because you really do look at how far you've come and you see the changes that you make in your practice to strengthen it as a business and to really focus on uh, being there and a better practice for your, for your patients moving forward. But certainly don't do it alone. Don't burden it on your shoulders and reach out to practice managers locally or even your accrediting agency. Absolutely, we're here to support you. Lovely. Thank you. I think also it's a case of that those fifth edition of the standards, as you've rightly pointed out, Kim, because they're more outcome focused and there's many ways to meet those requirements, it really is about creating systems that work in your situation, in your individual practices, not just doing it, doing something for the sake of accreditation. So I think that's really important benefit of the fifth edition as well. Thank you. I think we have worked through all the questions. I hope you've gained some good information. I'm going to switch over and do a presentation of Practice Hub, which obviously you've heard about from Carmel, but really I'll be focusing on some of the things that we've talked about regarding, you know, how it applies to an accreditation in the practice. So let me just bring that up. Please keep um, your questions coming. We will allow a little bit of time at the end to answer them. All right. So as I said, focusing on the the accreditation relevance within Practice Hub, we have a whole series of applications. So an area for your policies and procedures, an area to set up tasks, send messages to your team. So, you know, we've got a reminder, we're having our accreditation prep meeting on Thursday. So just being able to use things like that to kind of get that whole team engaged with the process as well. So people know what's happening. We have registers for equipment and contracts and insurance training modules we have an application for you to be able to record certificates of insurance details and for practitioners who are insured with Avant you can even automate that so the data comes through directly from Avant and you never have to chase them up again for that policy document which I think is pretty exciting we also have an application so one of the things you know need to provide is evidence of ARPA registration well we've got an application that also has that information and is updated daily so you have the most current version of someone's registration status, a document storage facility and some other functions in there. So we might start with the policy and procedures manual. 
Now, many of our clients get our policy and procedure templates. I know there's a range of different templates out there, but I think the key message is it's absolutely easier to edit something someone else has written than to start from scratch with this information. So that's why I'd be sort of thinking, one of the things that we do for general practices who take up our templates is we set them up in line with the standards. So those of you who've been through the fifth edition or are aware of it, going through prepping, you would recognise all these. So, you know, core one to eight, uh, the quality improvement standards, and then the core, uh, sorry, the GP standards. So it's a really good way of sort of connecting that, you know, everything that relates back to accreditation, there's relevant policies for those. So when we go into each of the different categories, we can go and see which are the policies that relate to that particular standard and we can see that information. So I think having that structure just makes it really easy also when you're preparing for accreditation, but reinforces that information and that those things back to your team as well when they're using this. One of the things we quite like is that on different pages, you can actually link to the standards. So if I tick this button on the filter, let me find one that's open here. So I can see our information security policies and I can see that it's linked to this particular standard. So core 6.4, which is the information management one. So it's a really clever way of kind of bringing that whole information ecosystem together so that you can link back why you do what you do. So when you're talking to your team or if they're reading these policies, they can go back through and go, okay, why is this like this? And they can easily cross-reference with the standard themselves. As Kim has said, the fifth edition is very much less about process focused and more about outcomes focused. So I think very much the policy is the why you're doing what you're doing, what is the outcome you're looking for. But it is always handy in many instances to actually document the processes or the procedures, again, to give that transparency to the whole practice team. So there's a consistent approach in the way that things are done. So being able to have that information in there is really useful. I also think, you know, documentation evidence is one piece of that puzzle. You know, they're coming in, they're coming, the surveyors come on site, they're doing interviews, they're doing observation. So this is one piece of the evidence puzzle, having the information in here as well. So we have some policies and procedures there. Again, thinking about, I was just looking at, you know, the top five non-compliance. And, you know, we talked about the medicines management. So, you know, policies around how do you manage your Schedule 8 and Schedule 4 drugs. And, of course, as we talked about, each state has different legislative requirements. So it's really, really simple to be able to put links into the relevant information in there. The other thing I think is really useful is cross-referencing between different policies. So this is about talking about our control drugs, and we can cross-reference that with our managing perishable policy as well. So also what was on our non-compliance, so we had the medicines management, we had risk management, so we've got policies relating to risk management. And the, the question back then about the Excel, Word documents, all of that sort of thing, things that we can set up or you can set up really easily in Practice Hub, these registers, which are really simple tables, but I think it's important. It's about what you're working through. So what were the details? What were the contributing causes? What was the impact? What existing controls do you have and so on? And being able to work through those and sort of organising your thoughts into the tables, I think is really valuable. Other things, if it were me in my practice, I'd probably set a reminder date every month. So, you know, I would probably set a monthly review of this so that it would prompt me and it might be in line with, say, our practice team meetings to say, OK, as part of an agenda item on our team meeting is to go through and have a look at our registers. Let's have a look at our quality register, our incident register and our risk register. So let's work through and have a look at those and, and talk with the team about them, how are we going to mitigate those risks. Risks, what have we learned? Are we seeing a trend? Because that's what this is about. It's about making the practice safer for the team and for your patients. And how can you do that? And when it comes to things like recording CPR and CPD training, something that a lot of clients do in Practice Hub is they create a personnel section and then they can set up a page for different individuals in the practice and they can go through the issues and they can go through it and they can link the training for that person. So 
go to the extent of doing a training and development plan, but more importantly, record the training that person has done. And whether it's in-house or external, it's still worth recording that information. And then when it comes to things like their CPR training, you can upload their certificates, making it really simple to use. And Carmel, I know you've had your Practice Hub site for quite a long time now, so your list of attachments is quite extensive for many of your long-term staff, isn't it? It's, um, it's, I always think it's quite lovely to see. You've kind of got this lovely list and everything's laid out and easy to find. And again, so those consent and refusal forms that your staff sign off on for their immunisations, they can all be there. So any sort of documentation that you have for your practice staff, or your practice team can be in there. It's probably also worth noting at this stage that not everybody has to see everything. So what information you're putting here is not out there for everyone in the practice to see. You can restrict access to various people as to who sees what as well. So a couple of other things I was going to talk to you, things that you need to have a look at is the ARPA alerts. So I think this is fantastic because you're either, usually people tend to um, once a year around about that end of September for the doctors and May for the nurses, tend to go in, check if they've renewed, yes, they have, print off the document, et cetera, or ask for it. This allows you to put the person's information in. So you'll have your practitioner, their ARPA number, and sorry, you would have seen, sorry, on that summary, you can see that it was checked that they are, in fact, the status is registered. And if you want to see more detail, so I just did, you can go to the link and you can see the information is basically a direct feed from the ARPA website. So if there's any conditions, undertaking, reprimands, etc., you'll get notification as soon as they come through from ARPRA. And as I say, that's tested on, checked on a daily basis. So one of those things where it's just a really simple process, enter their ARPRA number, and it's a bit set and forget. Um, the other thing, of course, that's important is this works for anyone who's registered with ARPRA, not just medical practitioners. So it's a great place to put all the numbers for your nursing staff, your allied health, and so on. And that's really useful as well. Other things, the equipment register. So, of course, a key component is um, ensuring that your equipment is properly maintained. And so the equipment register is a really good way to do this. I know a lot of people tend to have the maintenance reminders in Outlook. They'll have an Excel spreadsheet with all the equipment listed, and then they'll have all the documentation related to that piece of equipment stored in hard copy or soft copy somewhere. So this brings all of those three components into one place. So if we have a look at our steriliser, you can see that I've got the details. I can put the serial number, model number, where it's located. Did we purchase it outright? Is it rented, leased, et cetera? One of the things I recommend people do is put a hyperlink into the user manual as opposed to having to either Google it or turn the machine around trying to find those details. Again, just that making information easy to find. And then easily to add the maintenance frequency. Who is the person responsible? What organisation does that for you? And in the case, of course, of sterilizers, we need our certification calibration. So you can include that information in there as well. And the beauty of that, of course, is now that all those dates are there, via the dashboard, I'll get reminders of when those things are due a month beforehand. So I can start to, you know, ring the technician, make the booking, make sure I'm planning these things ahead of time so that they're all done in a timely manner. I'll just take you back to certificate of insurance because I think this is, again, a time saver, especially for the admin team. And this is, again, very similar to the APRA alerts application, a great way to store and monitor the insurance status of your practitioners. So you can see that in this instance, the policy's expired. It has been provided, but it's expired. So I'd be able to follow up with that practitioner and say, can you please provide the new one? And as I mentioned before, if they're insured with Avant, they can do this manual process or they can just provide consent and it gets uploaded automatically. You don't even need to follow it up. So different things that are bringing all that information that you need to collate for accreditation all into sort of one simple platform. The other part that I think is really, really critical because I always think of accreditation as being a systems process. If you set up systems, things just flow and you won't be in that sort of position of, 
sitting up in bed at 3 a.m. going, oh, I've forgotten to do such and such. So being able to set up recurring tasks is really useful. So things like, you know, doing the emergency trolley check, things like restocking your consulting rooms. We talked about medicines management. So obviously having a task in there that you can assign to the right people to make sure that your medicines and other consumables, perishables are checked on a regular basis. So whatever frequency you determine that that's happening. And if you're the manager or the practice principal, you can easily monitor if those things are being completed and there will be that ability to monitor that as well. So I think that that's really simple. So to give you a quick look at what this looks like, we've got a, a bit of a description about the task. We've got the steps involved to do it. And I also think this is a terrific training tool. So you imagine you've got someone new to the practice and you can assign them this task in their role as perhaps the nurse or the recept admin person, whoever's responsible. And it's a really good training um, checklist for them. So they know the steps that they need to do and nothing gets missed and they can tick them off as they go. So really helpful. And also that ability to link them back to the relevant policies as well. So as I say, if you're really thinking about setting up this kind of system where you don't have to keep remembering things and worrying that you've missed things, this is a terrific way of doing that as well. Carmel, I'll put you on the spot again and ask, is there anything that you would want me to highlight to our audience this afternoon that I've missed? Um, thanks, Anna Maria. A couple of things about the hub. I, I, like, I really like the fact that I don't keep anything in the filing cabinet now that's gone. I like the fact that it gives, sends me reminders all the time because I've got a lot of doctors, a lot of staff, and trying to keep track of all that is really important to me, obviously. The new, the innovative APRA alerts is great because, again, I don't check every week or every month what's going on with APRA and our staff. And I've got five nurses, 14 doctors working for me. So basically that, that comes up as an alert if there's anything. And that's the sort of really helpful stuff Run it, try to run a big practice um, or any practice because alerts are things that it'll hit you, it'll make you aware. If there's been any issue with the doctor, up it'll come and I can deal with it. Um, especially if you were looking at a multi-site practice um, and try to run that, that'll be even more essential. So I really do like the hub, for the, especially for these particular things that I have. Keeping everything in one place is amazing. And Carmel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've, um, I hadn't mentioned before, but the training modules, I think you assign those to all your new staff, don't you? Yes. So basically, Anna Maria, I have a new staff and some of the new staff really never worked in medical, the medical industry at all. So basically, I can sit them down and they can just start doing a bit of basic training in, in essentials, how we manage things especially about privacy and confidentiality, because those words mean nothing to them. You know, the whole training that's been built in, because there's not a lot offered to this, at this sort of level, it's all built into the, the hub for me. And I don't have to sort of sit down and keep coaching them on it. And then often they actually sign off if they've read something on it. And if we have to come back and discuss it again, I say, well, you've actually signed off, you've read it, you can't say that you haven't. So they're the things that really make life quite easy for me. And the staff start to understand why things happen for them. Excellent. You made a good point there too, Carmel, when you talked about the staff signing off. So one of the things you can get your team to do, it's great to have all these policies and procedures, but it's also helpful if you can have some sort of record that they have actually read the policies. And I guess the old school way is emailing or circulating these documents and then getting them signed, counting back how many you gave out, how many you got back. Within here, it's really simple to do it electronically. So you're required to read it. I've understood and agree to comply and they click on confirm and you now have a record of that confirmation as well. So that ties in really neatly too with the training modules. All right, I might just stop there and come back to our chat list. No, you didn't need to be an Avant member to access Practice Hub. Kim, one for you. Where can we get the questions the surveyor asked the medical director during an accreditation visit? Is there a secret list? <laughs> so if you're an AGPAR client, yes, there is. Uh, we do provide a lot of support and resources to our clients. Included in that are those list of the mandatory documents, the documents that could potentially be uh, requested as part of your accreditation assessment. And we also break down the list of questions that will be asked of the various uh, roles in your practice. So 
whether mm -hmm. you have clinical staff, we've got the list of questions that we ask of the clinical staff, of the practice manager, as well, as well as the GP and administrative staff. So get in touch with your client liaison officer and we'll be sure to share that secret document with you. <laughs> Apparently not so secret. No. <laughs> uh, a question, sorry, Kim, again for you. Can I skip Fine. the maintenance on a yearly basis? Can I just do it before accreditation? Absolutely not. So there will be requirements for equipment to be managed and maintained and checked on a weekly, monthly quarterly, annual basis. So it's really important that you look at what the manufacturer's requirements are and what validation requirements are that your equipment is maintained in line with that. So if you look at cold chain management, there's a requirement for an annual audit, maintenance of batteries for the coolers, for the transport arrangements. But then you're also looking at uh, annual sterilization validation. So accreditation once every three years you're putting patients at risk of harm if you're not doing maintenance of your equipment in, in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations. Exactly. Terrific. Thank you. I think this is a practice hub related question about how to manage all the uploaded documents. So removing old certificates, etc. You can either give our support team a quick call, but I will show you very quickly. If you have a document that is no longer current, so maybe last year's CPR certificate or, or training, whatever has is being superseded by a new one, you can deactivate it or delete it. Everything in Practice Hub is a soft delete, so it will always be retrievable by an administrator within your organisation, not us, if you need to do that, or you can simply replace the existing one with the new one in the same entry. So I think that's terrific because it means that, you know, this is the beauty, I think, of electronic storage is the capacity is almost infinite and you're not sort of filling up filing cabinets with old documents or having to shred old stuff all the time. But really simple, just either deactivate or delete it. For any of you Practice Hub users out there, if you want to know more about that, please give our lovely support team a call. Some information on there if you're already a client and you need more information contact us. Obviously if you're undertaking accreditation with AgPal they also have an incredibly amazing support team there as well the client liaison officers is that their correct term? Yes. If you're not a Practice Hub client please visit our website and if you do want more information or other resources we're really building an excellent library of articles and other information on our website based on some of our webinars where you can see the recordings or different articles and please register for any upcoming webinars or contact us for more information. Kim and Carmel any final words um, as we thank you so much for your time and your information today. I think it's been really amazing and, and it's really brought a lot of things to life, I think. You read this stuff on paper, but hearing you talk about it has been really terrific. Yeah, and I think, you know, my final words would just be, it's really important to understand what the intent of, intent of the RACGP standards are. Just bringing back to my opening remarks that it's not about ticking a box. It's not about red tape and, and a burden, something that's forced on your practice. It's really have a look at the detail and really understand why things are important, why the standards are there, what structure there is, and it will really make sense if you look into it in depth. And please reach out if you ever need, do need any assistance because we're more than happy to, to help you through your journey. Excellent. And Carmel, after a brief uh, break, you're, you're off and running again with the, ready for the next one in three years. <laughs> Thanks, Anna Maria. My only tip really is keep it in mind Things like incidents, you know, they do happen to all of us. Keep a list, keep it on the hub, keep it somewhere for yourself so that when it does come, you'll you'll have them there for you. Um, because if you try to leave it till the last month or two, it just, it's too overwhelming. Good luck, everyone. Great tip. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to our audience for joining us this afternoon or evening, depending where you are. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you.